And welcome back to MSI 2023 here from the Copper Box Arena Come on, in Medi. Berlin, Come on. Berlin, London. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I was going to say, you have to be like, hello, London. You know what I mean? Like, that's... See? I, I'm not a stereotyper like you, Benny. I realize the Welsh can be. We're British, bro. A little bit You've got to be like with this, the gang, in it. In it, bro. In it, bro. <laughs> the is, my, my voice is posh enough it that it really posh, sounds yeah. condescending <laughs> when I do that. All right, bro. Hello, in it, fellow bro. Brits. Well, oh, quite, yes. Uh, it's so today it's we'll a have pleasure some tea to time. have your acquaintance today. Um, we are getting ready, ho, for <laughs> We're getting ready for game two between DFM and Loud. Obviously, Loud find themselves one up in the series. If you have just joined us, uh, you missed what was a very one-sided affair yeah. as Loud decimated their opposition. And as we get into draft for game two, DFM will be moving over to the blue side. Their backs are against the wall. A loss here will mean their departure from MSI 2023 as Loud will continue on through the lower bracket play-in stage. And already the bands are coming out thick and fast. And Medic, so far it looks like the things aren't changing that dramatically. Uh, we are seeing some pretty stock standard stuff. It's actually very reminiscent of what we saw from the previous game with mainly things like the Lucian taken off the board, the Olaf and the Nautilus, with Varus and Vi also being removed. Yeah, in fact, it's exactly the same as we saw in the previous game so far. There's the Rakan, so phase one bans remain perfectly uh, the same as what we had in game one. Now the question is, with DFM electing to be on the blue side, what is their priority? They could look towards the Gragas, that was Pol 2's most played across the course oh, of 2023. Days. They'll lock it in. For him, we expect, could of course be flexed, but we actually haven't seen it played in any other role, but still having it once in the jungle for DFM. Yeah, it's, it's expectations are that this is for Toll too. Yeah. You know, uh, ov obviously as a champion, it can be flexed, but uh, Lau, they're saying, why fix what isn't broken? Aphelios Maokai can be the lock-in for them. Obviously already a very strong team fighting core, and uh, it's something that well, Root is going to be more than happy to get his hands on. I think it is his most played champion so far this year. It's something that he has a lot of success on. And we've seen how proficient he is at the champion as well. Wouldn't be surprised to see the Tom Kench already locked in for them as well. But it depends, because Loud may say, you know what? We actually don't need to provide that much peel when we are playing this front-to-back composition. It's fine, so they can actually just lock in their mid. They can lock in an answer into the expected Gragas top if they wanted to as well. They've showcased that they can be quite flexible with their support option. You can see DFM realizing perhaps jungle was a little bit of an issue in game one. Picking the Viego, if he gets resets in a fight, can absolutely take over the game, of course, and gives you a little bit more flexibility coming into the later portion of the game than in Nidalee just chucking spears across the wall and hoping something sticks. The Thresh I would love from Loud because it gives you not only usual disengage and a bit of pick potential, but it gives you extra disengage when you're against a Greg. Something like a Tom Kench could be knocked in with the explosive cask and then who cares if you devour your Aphelios who's still in the middle of the enemy team. Whereas with a Thresh, you can stand that little bit further back and you always have the Lantern for the extra added safety. Uh, I was about to say, I wouldn't be surprised to see a Blitzcrank and a Tom Kench fan. Yep. Uh, with Nautilus already removed, I think Tom Kench, especially into this composition, could be so good. The other thing we're thinking about is a Braum. I was thinking about Braum in the last game, but because they prioritized the Lulu so early, it wasn't something that was really an option. But when you have such a heavy team fight that just kind of walks into you, Braum can be so effective and it might be something they want to remove. No, so both Tom Kench and Braum are available. I think both can be very solid picks for Harp if that's the direction that he wants to go in. He, of course, does have an incredibly deep champion pool, so wouldn't be surprised to see a number of different things come out from him. It depends what DFM want to do with the remainder of the draft. Expectations are that we'll see top lane come through from Loud, something relatively safe. They may just run back the Gnar once again. They could even go for the Scion themselves if they just want to make sure that they have a solid front line. They have a lot of options at their disposal. The Swain man does suggest that DFM may be looking at an Ari once more. Yeah, giving Ari to Ari up is uh, something that has happened very often for DFM and has worked yes. very often for DFM. Won four of his six games on it this year. I wonder if Loud will look up towards the top lane. Nah, for Robo, he had a great performance on it in game one and into the Gragas can still have a relatively favorable matchup, especially with how Robo is playing right now. DFM will look towards their mid and support. As you say, Tom Kench a possibility. I think it doesn't give Harp enough agency for my own liking, but in terms of compositionally, T Tom Kench makes a lot of sense. Well, we'll have to wait and see. We need to see a mid laner locked in. Oh, wow, are they gonna go? <laughs> 
might be going in the direction that you want, Medic, and that yep. they will. Like so they that. one harp on an engage, and the Leona will be locked in. Leona Jinx, a bot lane that we don't often see. Mm -hmm. Obviously, one champion would prefer to scale, wait a little bit longer, whereas the other one wants to be a little bit more aggressive in lane. But admittedly, Leona, while not the best at peeling for a Jinx, can offer a lot of teamfight tools. Personally, I'm a big fan of Silas and Tamaokai. I think that what we saw at Worlds, when uh, Zekka specifically was using yeah. it as an answer into Maokai, like it, it proves how effective it can be to steal away the Maokai ultimate and have that tool available in team fights. Immediately, Tinone's responding with Cassio of his own, a tried and true champion of his, something that he's used consistently throughout his career and often defaulted back onto should the situation arrive. You can see that the DFM fans are still present in the audience, even if the loud fans are to their name louder. We'll see if TFM can bounce back. I think they have a little bit more of a well-rounded composition this time around, but Loud sticking to what they won with in game one. Yeah, good front to back with a tank in the form of the Maokai, some protection in the form of the Thresh, and Loud, if they can get that early lead, or even keep the early game stable, do scale incredibly well. DFM have a little bit more, to the, a few more arrows in their quiver. A few more notches on their bow with the addition of this Silas and the Viego, who just gives you a little bit more pressure as the game goes on over that Nidalee. I like the Gragas as well for Tol2. It means that he can have some agency of his own, can disrupt the fight. Uh, as on the Scion, he really struggled to actually be in the action. I was often just dodged to the side off. Some of the things that concern me for DFM is that you have basically four melee champions into Cassio Maokai. Yeah. Um, on top of the fact that Aphelios loves champions that comes into him, uh, it, it's it's a situation where, again, DFM, I think that like compositionally, it's harder to execute. Uh, the, the burden of execution does fall on them, and that's not to say that they need to get an early game lead with a comp like this. I think their scaling is a little bit better, and they have a few more tools in the fight. But uh, by no means will these fights be easy. We'll be keeping my eyes on the mid jungle of DFM once more. We'll see if Arya can be unleashed on the map because this matchup specifically is going to be a tough one for Arya to navigate. Obviously, playing into range can be a little bit tricky. Arya going for the first strike. Tinones with the Conqueror in that mid lane. Once again, an aftershock now. I know real surprises when you look across the board. In terms of runes, everything pretty stock standard. I'll remind everyone watching, you can log into your Riot account and watch MSI on lolesports.com to earn exclusive in-game content. And new MSI specific emotes and icons are dropping. It's active right now and will run through the entire tournament. Did get a capsule uh, yesterday as well. Did you? Yeah. I do collect them though, because I'm fortunate enough to be part of the League Partner Program, so I oh. get the skins unlocked for me, but I just have this collection of like 50 capsules from Worlds 2020. Wow, what a humble brag. Right? I know, it's a huge brag, you know. What a humble I, brag. Look at all this digital stuff I have, Benny. <laughs> <laughs> I can't sell it, I can open it, but it gives me skins I already have. Opening it is the best part. It is the best part, it's, it's an enjoyable experience. And for the moment, Loud having an enjoyable Friday afternoon as they won game one here against DFM, we'll see. What DFM can do, their early game in game one was pretty strong. Like they, they, they were able to get that lead. They had about a thousand gold. Obviously, it was it's the, mitigated uh, by Lau. It's the. I mean, wait, sorry, were you saying DFM had a strong Yeah, lead? yeah, they, they got about a thousand gold ahead. I know? mean, they, they found a gank. Yeah. <laughs> that's a strong. In my <laughs> opinion, if you have a kill and the enemy team doesn't have a kill, you have a gold lead. That's a uh, strong. Early I mean, game. yeah. The, I think that this game, they have more options to find ganks, mm -hmm. and mainly because Harp is on an engage. True. Uh, Arya does also have some setup in lane. I think the top lane just needs to be left alone once again. This is a very bot side focused draft once more. Toltu though, gonna be feeling very confident on a pick that he knows is comfortable for him. This could be a good trade for him. Yeah, looks for the damage onto Robo. Robo trying to build up that Mega Nah. Gets it, gets the wallop off, but Toltu can continue to chase him down. Robo won't invest the flash. Heals up with that potion, the Dormant Shield as well. Ticking him over I and really now Croc can look up here. Kill him. I thought that if he had W, E, W into Flash, E, Auto, yeah. could have been enough to get a kill. Only level two though, so Q, E was his uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't realize that he started with the Q, so not bad there. Croc though hovering around, now Toltu hits the level three. Now he's definitely got, he's within kill range, and I think Croc is looking to try and take advantage of this if Toltu does commit the Flash. Robo gets to level three as well. Looks for the Boomerang, gets a bit of damage down. The cask out, of course, this ward. 
the chat will be spamming minus one now. Sorry, it's all two. Nothing you can do about it. But a full clear coming out from Steel. They have no information as to where Croc started, but Steel, unbeknownst to him, is already building a bit of an advantage. The bot lane does have the shove, and Tinone's proving why this matchup can be quite challenging. I was kind of expecting Aria to maybe start with a corrupting pot to mitigate some of that, but instead choosing not to. Steel now threatening a dive, and I think this does make a lot of sense. You've got to be careful, though, as Robo gets closer oh, and closer so to Mega. Low. But even with Mega, I still think that they have the ability to get the kill here. Steel just trying to buy time. Robo levels up, hits four. Still 200 low. HP the on HP him. HP is so low. Here they go. They're looking for the dive. Flash E, there's the kill. Toll 2 gets out. Steel secures it. I talked about how I thought that they were just going to leave the top side of the map alone, but they find a good kill. Now the hook comes through. Seros predicting the sidestep, maybe even the flash from Udafon. But Udafon holds his nerve and no advantage is gained. So DFM once again find first blood, but they find it in the top side of the map. And part of the safety for that gank for DFM, because they did spend a little bit of time up there, is the, is the vision they had. They actually had a ward on Croc's blue buff, so they knew he was working his way down towards that bottom side. Croc has yet to clear out his wolves, his gromp, or his blue. Instead, prioritizing getting these razor beaks. Krugs as well have spawned, and then after this clear, he can pass down through bots and perhaps look for a possible gank on the Udipon and Harp combination. That is what worked for Loud in game one, getting Root ahead, and Root showed that if you invest into him, he's very willing to be aggressive in these team fights later on. Certainly is. Root is a player that we'll have to keep our eyes on as the game continues. Right now, very even in CS. The bot lane has been very quiet, as to be expected. Robo losing his life, definitely not part of Loud's early game plan, but a bit of a trade hit. I don't think it's gonna result in a huge amount, though. Keeping my eyes on Steel as he navigates his way into Fog of War in bot lane. They should have information, DFM. Oh, those wards actually timed out. Well, they should definitely know that. But with the wave pushing in, there is a big opportunity here. But you imagine that Loud wants to try and reset after clearing out these waves as well. So, Steel is mainly here. Let's look for an opportunity. Oh, was he not spotted? No. If you hug the wall just like that, you can get in into that second bush. But you can see, Root and Seos know that something may be happening. Zenith played from Harp, good play away. Root stunned up, though the Lantern going down, but Root locked down. And Unipon on the board, 2-0 now for DFM. The chain CC was clean from DFM. I believe it was the stun from Steel into the Q stun from Harp. So even though the Chompers couldn't connect, the CC duration was good. DFM find themselves another kill. This early game now is Medic going very well for DFM. Already a 700 gold lead and Root shut down. Didn't burn the cleanse or the flash in that last play. So deciding that he wasn't going to get away anyway, even if he had used those summoners. Udipon goes back. He bought Berserkers, decides instead a Noon Quiver, the name of the game, alongside a cult to try and keep that gold stacking up. Loud using the opportunity because DFM had to push in the wave and then reset there, going back to base, which means when we come out from, you know, the realm of death, we can pass it, uh, pass it down towards this dragon, secure the first drake of the game. Robo trading here in the top lane with Toll 2, winning it out right now. The wallop into the wall, into the mini nar, into the explosive cast, but Toll 2, very low on mana, puts down another barrel. He's going to be able to sustain himself oh, up with that happy his way up. As you say, Arya on his way. Robo does have the flash, the boomerang coming out, looking for the hyper charge. Arya comes in, and down goes Robo. A great roam from Arya. I was wondering why Toltu was running up in yeah. the lane. I was like, shouldn't you be running away? But his whole plan was to cut off the options for Robo when it came to getting closer to the tower. He kind of forced him closer to the wall, which indirectly forced him closer to Arya, making it then easier to find that kill. Well play from DFM, Toltu. You're seeing the difference when he gets his hands on his comfort champion. He's doing so well in the matchup this time around. Uh, he's lost one game out of 12 on this champ this year. He's, as you say, incredibly comfortable. Maybe lucky number 13 for DFM. A win here, of course, would even out this series. But already a much better early game for DFM this time around. Now, admittedly loud, we already see how this composition works in the 5v5. You have slightly less engage options just because you've replaced the Thresh with a Leona. But by and large, the principle is still the same. Group up as five, leverage your team fight power, a lot of utility at your disposal. And you're going into what is a 
Cassio Ophelios. Yeah. Like it's a very powerful front to back team composition, which is why ideally what you want is to build these early game advantages where you can. Leverage the fact that Maokai isn't the strongest ganker. And then when you enter these mid game fights, you have that small gold advantage. So even the weaknesses from the comp are mitigated by the fact that you have that item or gold lead. So right now, DFM is off to a great start. And this could be a big fight for them. Keep your eyes on the supports. Harp, level six, on his way up or not. Actually, I feel like that would have been a really good opportunity to roam. DFM making the decision here not to contest this potentially. I think they wanted six on steel. They're gonna get it. Toll two, trying to get away from Robo. Flashes up. Running. They should fight. To get this. away from the twisted advance, but Toll two with a knock back into the heartbreaker. Robo low, 150 HP remaining on the nine. He's gonna try and kite away. Steel still on the chase. No flash for him. No ult, and Robo gets underneath the tower. Meanwhile. Toll 2 tries to dish some damage back out. Seal pops the hammer path and will be able to escape. And in the end, the Super Mega Death Rocket finds the NAR, finds the kill, and Udipon 2 0 to the good. Wow, Udipon, I wasn't expecting the rocket to come from downtown. DFM's bot lane looking much more comfortable this time around. That early kill combined with this one is going to put Udipon in a very comfortable position. I was surprised that Toltu would choose to flash away. I looked at that 2v2 and I said, there's no way that if Diego Gragas is going to lose that one. But it seems like that after a little bit of skirmishing, DFM realized the same thing and were able to find a good trade. They walk away with the Herald and now they can use this to really open up the game. Maybe they can funnel some gold into Arya, leveraging the mid lane plates, or maybe they just want to keep funneling gold into Utapon. Oh yeah, looks for the damage, Pack by Engage, dodged by Tinone, Spectral Moor, channeled by Steel, but won't be close enough to land that W on the Cassio, and in the end, Tinone's able to survive the Engage from Arya, who is at half HP. Tinone has to respect the fact that the enemy jungle and the enemy support are currently not seen on the map, and so they could come in, calling across Seos and Croc to try and bolster his defenses. Dragon spawning in about a minute and a half. That'll be the next main objective that both these teams play for. We see Steel hovering around mid with Seos right behind Tinones. A three versus two. Of course, they didn't have full information as to where Seos was, but with Arya's HP bar, it's not something that DFM feel confident in fighting right now. This yeah. will give loud access into the river. That control ward, though, just above Croc, not yet spotted along with a single ward, so DFM still have information in the bot river at the very least. They need Arya to come back to base. He does, of course, have the TP. Let's see if he picks up the Everfrost here. Would be really nice to grab, and that he will. Ahead of the Dragon, and this is what we're talking about. When you get those early gold leads, it can make a big difference in getting those early item spikes. And now you look at it with the Dragon spawning in about 40 seconds. In an ideal world, Udipon could get his Gale Force as well, but likely hasn't had the time for that now. But with the Everfrost in Arya's possession, it should be enough for DFM to gain control over this river start of this objective. Yeah, very possible that Lau just give it up. You don't have to fight this. It's only second dragon of the game. The stats an Ocean Soul gives are, you know, beneficial, but not so much that you want to throw away your lives in defense of it. And with DFM, as you say, having that 2,000 gold lead, Lau probably just want to sit back, reevaluate, work out exactly how they can scale into this game. The Rod of Ages on Tinones. Will in about 10 minutes, given that level up, of course. The Rift Herald charging in mid here, but still comes across. Arya still used away the Nature's Grasp and with the charge. I don't managed love to take down two plates. The use of Herald here for DFM. I think that when you saw three members mid, there was actually a great opportunity for you to threaten bot. Yep. You know, really start funneling those plates into Udipon. But I guess the idea was to keep loud underneath that tower, create this point of pressure. Arya will throw out the Maokai ultimate. Again, keeping that pressure up and just keeping Loud rooted to this mid-tier one. The Dragon will go to DFM uncontested. They will hold on to their gold lead for now. Overall, great early game from DFM. And from Toltu as well. Oh, like, yeah. It's taken him two days to really wake up, but in this game, the pressure he's putting down onto Robo, the fact he continually is winning out on these trades, still coming across as well as Robo does still have the flash. Still can look for the stun, but Robo will just hold the flash, gets underneath the tower. The Heartbreaker coming out as well, but the stun not quite connecting means that Robo is able to walk out of that one. Meanwhile, in the bottom side of the map, you can see Lau trying to get something, trying to at least deny a little bit of vision. They'll do exactly that and maybe steal away a red buff to boot. Yeah, the cross map makes a lot of sense here. An opportunity for Lau to get some plates back, get root a little bit more gold. 
Cloud actually choosing not to steal away the red buff here. A little bit surprising. That second plate didn't quite go over in favor of Loud. But Croc continues to hover. Tinones will be locked to his mid lane for the time being. Polter going back to base, but no TP. The engage. Locked the up. FM. Has the cleanse. The Lancer goes down as well. Root trying to disengage here. The Solar Flare hits, and Root locked up. The Flash comes out. Nature's Grass from the side as well. Moonlight Vigil will give Root a little bit of healing, and in the end, Loud are able to disengage. Croc has the flash. The Zenith Blade chases him though, and Arya can dash back in if he wants. Harp though now on the wrong side of the wall. He'll fall. Tinons takes him out. And the gold evens out just that little bit as Arya tries to escape from the Cassio, but can be some pretty difficult clutches to manage to wrangle yourself away from. And the hook landing onto Steel as well means that Seos and Tinons will be able to get another Unipon now taken down in the bot lane. And what was originally disaster for Lau turns into delight. Really good punish from Lau. And a massive overstep from DFM. Hart. He was not planning on going over that wall. No. Nope. A great flash from Croc drags him with him. And then Tino actually destroys the blast cone before Harp gets an opportunity to use it and get away to safety. Which means that a man down Loud see an opportunity to re-engage. So it all starts with a good setup initially from DFM. The cleanse gets forced out. The flash then comes through from Udipon saying, hey, you know what? I think I can get an execute onto Root here. He gets a big heal from his ultimate, thanks to the red gun. And then DFM is saying, you know what? Let's go for this flash in from Harp. And then look, he's locked over the wall. Tinones immediately hits the blast cone, which means the Harp can't get to safety. Free kill handed over to Tinones, and then DFM split up. And there's a bit of a mixed decision here. Arya's saying, you know what, I think I can fight Tinones. Steel's saying, I can help you. But now, as Arya is disengaging, Steel finds himself left isolated. And Udipon, in his attempt to then help him, isolates himself as well. So DFM kind of tried too hard to assist their teammates, which then baited one another into kill after kill after kill. Something Broxer told me once when he was training me how to jungle is dip the inters. Sometimes you just have to accept someone is dead. And uh, right there, DFM throwing good after bad, it seems, losing a couple of members, and now Loud with a gold lead, Betty, almost a thousand gold ahead. Going to be able to get a little bit more here as we see the MasterCard gold difference. 14, Root with a strong lead, 700 gold ahead, and it's only going to keep expanding as the game continues. You can see actually 900 gold now as we come past up towards the 16 minute mark. Rip held up a minute 23 on the Hextech Drake as well. Would only be the second of the game for either of these teams, but it feels like the Drake is just a backdrop. It's just scene setting for a fight. And both these teams seem willing to take a battle once again in the river. Right now, the Herald, the start, the Loud Steel trying to come in as well with that Herald path. We have to do a little bit. Harp coming oh, across. It's going to be a fight, Medic. It is, but look at how separated DFM are. The question is, can Toltu get onto the back line? Because that's a good position for the Grag, because the hook lands. As we put some damage down across the wall, Nature's Glass coming out as well, and Harp and Udipon still able to dodge away from that one, but Steel locked up towards the top side. The Harpbringer coming out, disengages Steel. Seos looking for another hit, hits onto Harp as Arya now stunned up down towards the top side of this fight as Harp is a low. Meanwhile, the engage from Tinos, he flashes forward, but already Root is down, and it's all on Tinos to do what he can here, but Arya dashing around. Steel with a heartbreak against one. Seos looking for the hook across the wall, but can't find it. Robo will fall as well. And in the end, it's DFM who come out on top. It's a one team fight for DFM, and the 80 carries from both sides were just obliterated. There is very little that can stop these top sides from just decimating the 80 carries. Root was taken out. Udipon was flashed on by Tinones. And it was up to the mid laners, the junglers, and the top laners, and it was DFM's top side that was able to walk away victorious. They will get themselves a rip herald. And after that bot side skirmish where Loud got a bunch of kills, I was getting concerned for DFM that it would be another affair of DFM floundering their early game advantage and Loud being able to win out on the team fights. But this bodes well for DFM as they showcase that as long as they can get that initial kill, the resets start to come through for steel. Arya can steal away a good ultimate. And these team fights are still very winnable for DFM. It's a first kill comp, buddy. You have so many resets. You've got the get excited from Udipon as well. If you can kill the first player, the rest of the fight very much starts going in your favor. 
And they have the tools to do that as well. They have the ability to isolate someone with the Solar Flare, with the Explosive Cast, lock them up, bring them back into your team, Hold and then take them out. But Toll 2, stepping a little bit too far forward in pursuit of the Dragon. He will fall. He almost gets away, but Robo in the end does manage to secure the kill. The chase continues with the Nature Scars. It's going to land a Twisted Advance, the Solar Flare, but Robo has the Nar. Steel flashes away from it, and now Croc is in a bad situation. Manages to escape with the Lantern. Root up towards the top of the fight. It's being isolated by Steel, but in the end, can just back away to the rest of his team. Arvi is on his way here as the pings come out for Loud. Rift held used in the mid lane. DFM trying to keep the tempo of the game up, trying to keep Loud away from the Seos. bot side river, but Seos lands the hook, half played back, Seos low, Aria diving in, a stopwatch from Seos, buys him, just a second more time, and buys him, a way to survive as well, Aria now trying to get away from the twin fangs, he dives back in, but Medusa catches him in the grasp, the shutdown going out as Unipol will fall as well, and Loud absolutely decimate the fight. It looks like a good opportunity for DFM, the re-engage looked promising, but Seos with the stopwatch, Tino with the ultimate, and Loud with the victorious fight are putting them in a fantastic position to 2-0 this series and move forward in the play-in stage. This will be another dragon going into the back pocket of Loud. Another one team fight going to Loud and the, found, the fans are erupting. It's not done yet, but you can hear the elation in the Loud fans' voices. Brazil, CB LOL never won a best of series as Seos finds it, oh. the play away from the blast cone, another hook comes out as Thresh can just dish him out for dinner, Steel trying to get away, the ignite is taken for the boomerang, hits him in the backside and ends his life, Baron up in 30 seconds buddy. That's a 30 second death timer for Steel as well, it would be ambitious for Loud to force it, but you know what, why not, they see how strong Tin owns is, when you have a Phalios and Cassio, your ability to melt this Baron is incredibly fast. And they may just do it. You can just look to control the jungle as well. There are still littered wards in this I think they're doing it. jungle. One second, Tin owns. He's going to start that Baron up immediately. Robo, Nars away Aria, that's a big ultimate used before the fight begins. The Super Mega Death Rocket saw them there and you can see the TP already from Toll 2. They know DFM realize that the tempo has been quickened here. They are called to a battle in the river, but right now Loud have already skilled the Baron and maybe they'll just look to get out. They can retreat instead. Root advances, Unipon has to flash across the wall. Root survives as Steel goes down. Another will fall as Toll 2 finds himself in the midst of five. Loud get the Baron, get two and clean up the fight. Loud get everything that they could want and DFM is falling apart. They had a great early game, but the skirmishes did not go in their favor. They made small mistakes that Loud have been very quick to punish and the confidence from this Loud squad is something that cannot be slowed down. They began the bound without hesitation. Look at the Miasma to cut off the entrance. The Maokai ultimate as well. Steel gets desperate as he and Utapon try to find a pick onto Root. Root just forces Utapon out of the fight completely. A great flash from Root to sidestep the Heartbreaker. And with all of the shurikens lying in wait, Root walks away victorious. Loud walk away victorious, and Loud are looking to 2-0 DFM and get their revenge from Worlds last year. The addition from Root, of Root, in fact, transforms the landscape against the FM, it seems. Loud now just have to cross their T's and dot their I's. They're pushing in two waves. We saw this in the last game as well. Robo up towards the top side, dealing with Toll 2. DFM not defending their tier twos right now. The inhibitor will be the line of scrimmage, will be the line where the battle is drawn. Aria, Harp and Udipon just trying to find what they can. You do have two items on Aria. You have two items on Udipon. DFM have the tools in their kits to find their opposing men. The question is, can they do it in the face of Loud? All two. Oh no, he may have overstepped. Oh. He misses the barrel. Robo. Robo just feeling himself right now. Steel's going to go back in, but they cost him half his health. Meanwhile, Root in the mid lane, cycling through the guns as quickly as he can to take down this tower. Robo's going to get that Mega, get a health infusion from it as well, and the inhibitor tower in the mid lane will fall. Aria has the Nature's Grass stolen away. Perhaps that's their last hope of defense here for DFM. One moment between them and elimination from MSI 2023. One moment for someone to show their caliber.
DFM still defending, 8,000 gold behind now as their inhibitor in the mid lane falls. Loud are playing patiently once more with a convincing gold advantage. They split up into the 1-4. Tin owns smartly, positions himself in between the two lanes, ready to support whoever needs it, knowing the Robo and Root in isolation can do the damage that they need. Now Root committing onto this tower will melt through the objective. And what was that? Four or five towers secured in favor of Loud. 5.3k, 5.4k is the Baron power play. The Dragon spawns in a minute's time. And Loud will walk away with significant damage done. DFM, they're on their last legs. Their backs are completely against the wall. If they aren't able to find a miracle now, their journey at MSI 2023 will be over. See Loud starting to prepare for the final fight. Tin Owens gets himself a stopwatch, knows buying a little bit of time can be the difference maker. Root on his way to a third item, Aphelios Vision, cleared out by Loud. The Dragon up in 30 seconds time would only be sold point for them, but they're not going to sniff at a Hextech here, Vedi. The DFM backs against the wall, backs against the rope. Aria, perhaps a little bit overextended here. The darkness looms. Croc looms, Seos looms, but the rest of the team really aren't there to follow up. Robo looking for a little bit of damage. The Shirelli is coming out as well. And Avi is just chased down. Solar player used by DFM to try and disengage. But Loud, no minions here to push further forward. Supers in the mid lane start to do their work on their opposing minions. Loud, no Baron on them. The Drake still up if they wanted it, but instead they look for that fight down towards the bottom lane. Udipon will deal with the mid lane. And Loud will turn their eyes back towards that Drake. So overall, another advantage gain for Loud. They're able to force the flash out from Arya. They're able to secure themselves another objective. Now Loud have a few options here. They could either try and force, start playing through top side, play through bot, set up another 4-1 and slowly siege into the base, or they can just wait for the ban. They can still maintain this pressure, but they don't have to overcommit. They just chip away at the towers as they wait for the Baron to respawn, which I think is the slower, safer play. But Robo, oh boy. Then his blade goes in, the hook goes down, and Harps immediately locked up against the wall. The Nar coming out as well. Dragon will fall, still steals away. One gets the hook back in, as Toll 2 looks for a re-engage, but the petrifying gaze from Tin owns is perfect. Aria steals away the Nar, the cleanse comes out though, and now Aria is in the midst of three members of Loud, and they will shut him out. Unipon falls as well, and Loud can see the win in their eyes. Loud do not hesitate for a second. Even without Croc, they're able to find a fantastic fight. And it's the carries for Loud that come up clutch. They're looking the 2-0 DFM and claim their revenge. In 2022, it was DFM that denied Loud their shot at Worlds Group. Well, it seems like revenge is a dish best served cold as Loud will face PSG tomorrow. They want a little bit more. They don't want to let DFM get away unscathed. And in the end, they'll take the Nexus and make a date with destiny on the morrow. A 26 minute victory for Loud. Two very convincing games. And what a performance. They came in with a very clear game plan. They executed it extremely well. And you can see the elation on the faces of the fans. But of course, one success means another's defeat and heartbreak, of course, for DFM, an organization that is storied internationally, an organization that fought hard to get here, but they could not stand against the might and fury that was Loud today. Superb performance by Loud to secure the victory. And as you say, DFM incredibly decorated domestically, but just couldn't quite stand up to the challenge. A lot of credit has to go to Root, has to go to that bot lane of Loud. We had an incredible performance, and from LLL, it seems like it's WWW now as they continue to rack up these wins. Obviously, a very short turnaround before their next best of three. They'll play off against PSG, but I think having watched today, having watched how Loud played against G2, there's some hope for Loud in that series, not as one sided perhaps as some people would expect. Yeah, without getting too much into the granular, I think the big highlights are they found a formula that works, right? They don't need to be over-aggressive in the early game. 
they are confident in their individual skills and they believe that as long as they can get to the 5v5s, then that is the playground with which they will thrive. Yep. And they found great drafts to accommodate that. Big shout out needs to be given to Sales. His thrash was spectacular in game two. Consistently finding great picks, peeling for his AD carry where appropriate, and overall having a stellar performance. Loud will have their work cut out for them against PSG, but with a performance like this, if they can replicate this formula against a team like PSG, if you can go toe to toe with them in the 5v5s, this is a team that feels confident in that position. I think you're very momentum based as well. Like picking up these wins just bolsters your spirits. I think we see it from the crowd as well. Just so much support for them. But my expectations are that tomorrow will be a banger series. Of course, we see DFM on our screens. A struggle for them, especially after a strong performance at Worlds, especially after how much they have been rising as an organization, as a team. I think this will be a little bit disappointing, but of course, have to give them credit. They put on a great showing. It was close. And we will see them again, I'm sure, in the near future as they take about. London will bid their farewell. We will, of course, as well, bid our farewell to DFM. As the analyst desk was saying, a big fan favorite. They often represent the LJL at international competition. And I wouldn't be surprised if we see many of these faces once again when Worlds rolls around later in the year. Of course, frustration for DFM, but also... Elation for Loud. Yes, and an opportunity to breed hunger and a desire to continue to grow and compete at the highest level. And you have to remember, for players like Toltu, like, it's his rookie year. Sure. It's like he's, he's been playing like six months at the professional level. We were, while we wait for an interview with Tino, and so let's look at this replay where every second counts, thanks to the reliable Cisco network. Loud turn around the game with three kills in the bot lane to secure their region's first ever international series win to do it against the team that denied them in the past. What a performance, as we are just waiting for that replay to come up. But yeah, just incredible stuff. Obviously, credit to Tin Owns, credit to Root, credit to, I mean, all of all of the players. Robo, especially in game one, had a stellar performance, and there's someone that has been the lead for that team for so long. It is uh, heartening to see him being able to challenge at this level again. Yeah, for sure. I, uh, I'm consistently impressed with what Loud are able to do and the, the level of which they're able to, uh, to play at. Uh, let's see if they can continue that performance as they still have a difficult opponent ahead of them. They definitely do. Let's hear from Tin Owns, though, who is on stage with Frankie in the Verizon post-game interview. Thank you very much for joining me, Tin Owns. Now, hopefully you can hear me because the fans are so excited to be here supporting you in person. Before we talk about today's game, Tell me what you discussed with the team after the loss to G2. Então, primeiramente, a gente vai ver aqui tem os fãs aqui dando todo o suporte para você. Antes da gente falar sobre o jogo, vamos conversar. É, como é que foi esse re regrupo de vocês uh, depois do próximo jogo e o que vocês prepararam para agora? Uh, eu acho que a gente tentou mais jogar na nossa zona de conforto mesmo. A gente sabia, a gente não deixou de se abalar por conta do jogo da G2. E a gente mudou algumas coisas estrategicamente falando, algumas coisas que a gente nem usava tanto no Brasil, mas que a gente aprendeu aqui na Europa com o nosso bootcamp. E estou bem feliz de ter executado isso muito bem aqui, ter ganhado esse jogo. E a plateia brasileira assim mesmo, a gente já está acostumado lá no Brasil, eles fazem muito barulho. First of all, I'm pretty used with the, like, the crowd since Brazil. We used with the loud and all the noise that they can make. Like overall, what I could say is that like we try to play with a more like comfort zone, but we do came up with like some new tricks that we learned while we were doing the boot camp here in Europe. And I'm very happy that we actually achieved the result and could put in literally into the game what we learned and get this victory. Well, thank you. By the way, Arthur is translating for us today. Apologies, I did not introduce him it's on okay. stage. Uh, so, Tinos, tell me how comfortable you felt against DFM today, because it looked like you got the compositions you wanted. Então, vamos falar um pouquinho como quão confortável você se sentiu jogando hoje aqui contra DFM, porque você pareceu estar bem tranquilo. Eu acho que de uma forma geral está confortável tanto contra G2 quanto o DFM. É, eu acho que individualmente, quando vim num palco internacional, eu joguei muito mal internacionalmente, então esse ano eu queria fazer diferente, me preparei muito para estar aqui, então estou confiante para jogar contra qualquer um. Like... Like, overall, like, I've been preparing myself. Like... 
you want me to translate that? <laughs> I would love you to translate that. <laughs> For the God's sake, this is the best team from Brazil. Let's go. It's definitely <laughs> the best team from Brazil. Let's go, Lao fans. <laughs> Just before I let you go, I would like to ask you about what you need to beat PSG tomorrow to make it to the final best of five. Então, antes de deixar você ir, com relação ao jogo que a gente vai ter contra o PSG, o que vai preparar, o que a gente vai fazer? Uh, comparando um pouco com a DFM, o jogo da PSG, eu acho que eles são um pouquinho mais criativos que a, que a PSG, é, que a DFM, hum. mas é um time que... A gente está confortável de jogar contra, pelo que a gente assistiu deles, então a gente vai continuar mantendo o nosso jogo e entrar com a mesma mentalidade que eu acho que a gente pode vencer sim. Like, how do we gonna try to come in with the same like mental readiness like that we have for this play? I believe that they can be a little bit more like creative with the stretches and stuff, but nothing that we wouldn't like be able to prepare, like bring your best game and achieve for everything we want. Well, obrigada, Tenais. Thank you thank so you. much for talking to me. Congratulations. Thank you. And thank you to the Lao fans. You've definitely been the sixth team member today. Right now, though, we need to head back to Law and the desk for the cool down. Thank you so much, Frankie Tokens for Rise on Post Game Interview. Welcome to MSI Cool Down. After a glorious day for CBLO and LLA, best time to be a Latin American fan, guys. Definitely a surprise. The first time for both these teams picking up a series win in yeah. play-ins in the history of these series. It's incredible that both come on the same day. Uh, yeah. It's a very good time for both of them. Yeah, this will definitely go down as a historic day yeah. for a lot of play-ins teams. I mean, those two specifically in terms of not only actually securing this win, but specific for, uh, specifically for Loud as well. The performance too, definitely some of the most dominant we've seen in the region and specifically with Root down in that bot lane position. They had the fans behind them. They came ready, they can prep, and they didn't let it go. And I, as I was saying after the first game, I was mostly surprised of the adaptation from the loud side from the first game they played, yes, against G2, where they could have won it, but here they came ready, and no nerves involved. They, they kept on going with the game plan they had. It was amazing to see. Yeah, I was, especially in game two, when they fell behind with yeah. the four kills early on, I was grabbing snacks, I was getting ready for a long day, I was <laughs> like, ah, oh, this is going to go to game three, and they immediately bounced back in that long ball lane play, so really cool to see out of them. Yeah, I think it's just about the fact that they're really good at navigating their team fights too, even though they fall behind in that instant, they're not afraid to actually pull the trick in a play that they believe will be right. So I think for sure, huge credit to their team fighting tools. And we talked a bit about it in the first game. There are buttons. This time around, they found them again. Uh, or actually, this is actually game one going yeah. back to it. Yeah, going back to game one, big fight at the Dragon Pit. It felt like they won every single team fight for the most part was kind of in their favor playing to their strengths and uh, looking pretty good heading into tomorrow. I think PSG better be paying attention to this. It's going to be an interesting series for sure, but we have to talk about DFM, a region that we've been used to see as a surprising region, usually one of the minor regions <laughs> who performed the best. Um, they had to rebuild, of course, losing one of the key members in the likes of Abby, going to the LEC, Arya coming back after a difficult year in the LCK is not the team that <laughs> the fans are really loud, I love it. But yeah, this is not what we expected from the FM coming into the play in this I year. I mean, it was rough for them as a whole roster coming together as a team, but I still think we saw some individual shines, I think, in today's series <laughs> specifically. Steel, and yeah, you guys can finally see them now. They're just them. behind us, yeah. screaming. Okay, Mark keeps saying it with a smile as well while he's listening to them, so. It's fun. I, I, I enjoy it, and I think... Uh, for DFM, you know, a lot of people are saying, oh, the, the loss of Evie feels yeah. bad, but it's still four-ish of the same people. Arya has come and gone from DFM, and so it's not like this is some drastically weakened team that the CB LOL just took down. This is largely the same core of players that was sitting at the top of play-ins time and time again, and the fact that finally Loud has gotten over them is a huge accomplishment. I mean, yeah, that's the thing. When you look at Brazil over the years, they, they always created some surprises, winning against one of the most expected teams, I would say, but this is the first time they win so convincingly and also win a best of five in, in the history of play. And it's, it's so huge. interesting just hearing that statement, right? Because you just feel like some of the historic marks that CP yeah. has left, um, especially going back to Kaboom as well, but also tying in a group at some <laughs> point as well with EDG, like they've had stints throughout the years and specifically in play where it's like, 
I mean, surely they've, they've, they've moved on, right? But no, they haven't. It is the first time today, which is incredible. And it feels like a well-deserved and kind of lo a long time coming with Awaited, how popular yeah. that region is. They, their viewership has been great domestically. They've always had a large player base, and it felt like it was like a matter of time for whenever they would start punching above their weight class, and they, they finally were able to do it here today. We have to um, talk about one player in particular, the one plus player of the series here. And no surprise, I think it's Hoot. I would give it to the yeah, first import. Yeah, definitely so, agree. Yeah. But Laner here, what, what, did we, what did we think about his performance? I, I just love that, you know, he's so conscious of his own position in terms of when can I be the one who is actually even frontlining and making it work and I say 80 carry because of my damage output and when do I need to be in the back line and just be that reliable carry. Root just, you know, absolute insane performance. Goes to show why he was the first import as well to win CP LOL because he's damn good. Absolutely the case. Knows, if, especially the Aphelios gun usage, when yes. to use each of them like that. It, initial chase down sequence in the bot lane that got them back into this game. It was actually his red gun ultimate to get topped yep. up so that he could rejoin the fight later when it kind of broke apart. Just such heads up awareness of how to play these situations out, giving them this stable carry threat. You know, that's going to be really interesting as well with, for example, PSG Waco versus, you know, mm -hmm. Rude on the Aphelios 2-2 two, two guys has been really <laughs> happy for that specific champion. But yeah. That's something for the future, just yeah. something to be excited about. about. In the next few days, of course, quick words about the wor the first series that we had today, uh, GAM versus R7. Of course, disappointment when you look at the VCS region as a whole. Also, a region that's been used to surprising us in the play stage, also making it to later stages of the tournament. But this time around, it's, it's a real miss, Jimmy. I mean, they will be kicking themselves, for sure, because yeah. they could have won today's series. It's just that mm -hmm. simple. A lot of it comes down to execution, the game you're watching right now. Should absolutely have been won in the end, and it was a throw. Good resilience for R7, you have to credit that. But for VCS, there was high expectations, and sadly, they just weren't able to meet them. No, not at all. I think it was very nice to see the LLA bouncing back in games where they fell behind, being, like you said, tenacious. But uh, for the VCS side, this is the region that had not been able to attend quite as many international performances. They yeah. sent their second seed actually last MSI, and it gave people a lot of hope because that team actually did look pretty good with despite how much young its talent was. And then you get to see a lot of the returning faces like Levi that everyone was excited to see back on the international stage. And just a bit of a dud uh, at the end of the day, not able to perform at the level that a lot of us expect out of them. Um, but I'm sure they are going to come back to Worlds very, very hungry. Yeah, definitely. And we, we got a chance to talk to them still because after the GAM versus R7 series, Frankie caught up with GAM's head coach, Hanke, in the Verizon post-game interview. Thank you very much, Law. Coach Hanke joins me now. Thank you so much for agreeing to talk to me. Uh, talk to me about the series then. What do you think went wrong for the team? Uh, so the thing is, went wrong at the beginning of the event, if not, not just today but uh, we think that we can fix what we uh, the issue is but actually it's not because the, it's a really big problem for us like this the international experience for us like playing on the stage and have that huge crowd then we just like uh, not uh, be the same anymore as what we used to play in VCS. So this is the first international event of the year there's worlds as well so do you think that the experience you have had here in London might help when it comes to Korea? Uh, I think because we lost once in last year, we lost Worlds 2022. Uh, I think it's enough for us to like gaining experience. Yeah. Yes. It's a good thing to see. Why did the approach to the way that the team wants to play change between VCS and here at MSI? We were expecting a lot more team fighting from the outset from, from the team. So as what I just said, uh, mentality on the stage and somehow it's like uh, when we face here like a lot of top team top level team they are on like champion and second seat of the major league uh, when we face them in training or in on the stage like as what we have done with garden guidance they play like uh, they're more acti active than us and then we just keep the passive play because we we don't think that we can play the same as vcs when we bring something to here so we have to change and then we look for something new but uh, as the ritual is not. Do you think you'd change that approach if you make it to Worlds? So, there's a lot of things need to change, but uh, I think with what we are playing now, then uh, we will have a chance in Worlds. 
When it comes to Levi, he's calling the shots and he's got so much experience and the expectations, I guess, of the fans as well as his teammates on his shoulders. Talk to me about the change to the draft in that third and final game when we got to see him pull out the kindred. Uh, do you regret not bringing that in earlier? Uh, no, because the, um, I regret for not let him release another thing because he had to carry a lot like teammates and then main thing in the game that Shokon being a captain that everything that he have to carry on his shoulders and for for that the only thing I regret is not have him on beside uh, but about the kindred or playing something like in game champion like that um, we can play both style but we just pick the in game first and then when the things come to play carry for Levi and we just pick it. Well coach Hanke You've only just been promoted to head coach, literally at the start of this year. And the fact that you're coaching your team at an international event is incredibly impressive. So thank you so much for talking to me today. And hopefully we'll see you at Worlds. Thank you. Thank you. We'll head back to law. Very beautiful and emotional moment, of course, uh, on the side of Ghana. As we said, disappointing tournament for them so far. But it's a region that's been affected by the pandemic when they came back and didn't quite come back as strong as they were before. Yeah, you heard him kind of talking about yeah. not being used to playing in a venue quite this big with as many people screaming their heads off, this kind of stuff. I know as well for DFM, their finals, I believe, were remote. Yes. You can see them on webcams and stuff. So like, it's been a while for some of these teams had they been in front of a huge venue. And I think you could maybe see some nerves sometimes with the early games that some of these teams were going through. Yeah, I definitely think we saw some of the nerves and maybe just not limited to GAM as well either. I think we see some jitters as well, I think, but I think it's natural as well for minor. Yeah. Some of the minor regions don't want to compare it to, for example... I think Loud, Loud is very yeah, used to are. playing. Oh, they're used to it. Used yeah. to that, but <laughs> yeah. Some of them are not used to that kind of experience. And, and that's something that you got to take with you. It sounds really cliche, especially because so many of the minor regions have heard this before as well. But for a lot of these players, new players as well, who will be making their return or trying to make their return for the bigger events like Worlds, they need this experience. They need to have it. And sometimes you need to fall so you can get right back up. It's not going to be like, let's win Worlds potentially, yeah. but it's step by step. It's it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. These are two teams that are used to be in international events. So we'll see how and if they can come back later on this year at Worlds. But let's focus on the future and the teams we have left and advancing to the next stage. As tomorrow, we'll have Golden Guardians versus R7 and PSG versus Loud. Mark, I'm going to turn to you now for this one. How are we oh. sweating? <laughs> As how, how, many <laughs> how many people are still watching the stream? How many of my NA homies are in the chat? Because I will say I am not sweating after that series. Yeah. I'm no. feeling pretty good for Golden Guardians. I think movie star R7 will have to play a lot better tomorrow if they want to beat Golden Guardians. Yes, uh, you know, Golden Guardians bot lane got obliterated by Elk, but Elk is kind of one of a kind right now. And the rest of Golden Guardians actually did well enough to still take a game against BLG, which speaks to the fact that it is going to be an uphill battle if they want to take them down. Yeah, I think in that series, you know, Bung versus Licorice, that's what, that's what I'm looking that's for. That's actually that a good matchup. Um, but I also just think Loud versus PSG, with the level that Loud demonstrated today uh, and how PSG also played against the FM, it's going to be really curious to see how they're going to match up against each other because even even though there was a small few flaws by Loud here and there, most of the time they were a well old machine. So that matchup tomorrow, specifically between Rude and Wako, is going to be absolutely mental. That bot lane matchup is going to be crazy, as well as the fact that like, if you look at the two series that they played against their same mutual opponent, it was actually pretty comparable yeah. in a lot of ways. So I do think it's going to be a lot closer than you would have thought heading into the tournament, where a lot of people thought PSG was a dark horse favorite to get out of the group, yeah. getting a lot more contested than that exciting day of League of Legends we had today and what a historic day for Latin America as both CBLOL and LLA win the first ever best of series internationally. But job's not done. Tomorrow we'll see them again in another best of three. We'll see you then. Take care. Glacial path, you've already used your flash, and it's just a matter of who picks up this kill. And R7 have come out the gate swinging. Style is still working forward as the Jacks will pummel down Miru, and they just get absolutely everything. Seo tries to save the fight, but it ends up going Gam's way. And it's integrity, but if they can get Katy out, that would be the big thing here. Flash in, first blood, they lose the dragon, but they gain a kill. 
You see Style and Seo kind of going in for a little bit of an AD carry 1v1. So you can go for it. Nice flash from Seo. Means he gets the kill. Look for Dragon Jump on the Miru. Will he be able to get the damage down? They're just kiting him back. He's got the spell shield to come in. Oh, they got the ult as well. 50 50. They got the quickness in the back of the pit. Everybody jumping in. It's secured by Gam. And then the fight is all theirs. They will not be losing this series in this game. And they want to send us to three. We will see the knockback. Kati. It's pretty damn healthy, I will say. We'll get all out and all in. Bong with another solo kill, this time under the mid laner. Style needs to keep the VCS in this fight, but I don't think they can do it. And for the first nice time, oh, the nice LLA nice. will win a best of series at international competition. Has that wave trying to crash? Tino still on level two as Avi gets the charm, but the flash away from Tino means that he will survive. Steel diving in though, the never move won't land, and Steel gets first blood. Is that they're basing most of their attention down towards this bottom side? And DFM, the hammer's looking for a fight. Then the wave lands up towards the top side. Avi already caught. He's got a spear rush away. The ignite is taking the roof. Will take him. The charge coming in from Tall Two, but he's a little bit late to the party. Gale forces forward, hits the moonlight Mitchell, and assassinates her. Takes him out of the equation. I'm going here. Let's fight. Let's fight. I'm here, I'm here. Let's go, let's go, go, press. Uh, head press, maybe. Head press? No. Uh, I'm moving, I'm moving. We can go, go press, we can go press, we can go press. Actually, wait, 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 wait. Nice, nice. Nice. Let's go. Let's go. Nice. And now Arya is in the midst of three members of Loud, and they will shut him out. Unipon falls as well, and Loud can see the win in their eye. In 2022, it was DFM that denied Loud their shot at Worlds Group. Well, it seems like revenge is a dish best served cold as Loud will face PSG tomorrow. They want a little bit more. They don't want to let DFM get away.